Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to get to welcome you to this service of worship here at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We're so grateful that you're taking time out of your day to be here and to worship with us. We'd love the chance to connect with you. So if you would take a second and either click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and worshiping with us and also let us know how we can be praying for you. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. Gracious God, give to us the mind of Christ, who loved God and loved his neighbor, who healed the sick, fed the hungry, and prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him. May we follow his path in this life and the life to come. Amen. We have the privilege now of getting to go before God in prayer. Will you join me now as we pray together? Holy and loving God, your goodness is such that we do long for a thousand tongues to sing your great praise. We thank you for gathering us together today in your name. We thank you that your spirit is so expansive and so powerful that you are able to unite us together in worship even when we are separated physically and even separated by time. God, we give you thanks for community. We thank you for our friends and for our family and for a community of believers that exists across the globe. Hear us now as we silently lift up to you our prayers, our praises, and our thanksgiving. God, we confess to you that we sometimes squander the gift of community that you have given us by only spending time with people who think and look and act just like us. Or God, even by refusing to love the people that you've already placed into our lives who are most closely connected with us. Lord, forgive us for our failure to love and put the spirit of Jesus inside of us 
to learn to love not only our neighbors well, but also our enemies. Hear now our prayers of confession. God, we come to you today knowing that there is so much pain and suffering in this world. God, this week we were all especially hurt seeing all of the images of flooding in Asheville and all throughout the western part of our state of North Carolina. Lord, would you come into those communities and help them to find hope and healing? We pray for all of our early response teams that have gone in to help people begin to rebuild and get the support that they need. Lord, would you open up our eyes to see opportunities that you've given us to serve our neighbors? We pray also for your whole world, especially for places where there is not peace. We pray especially for the Middle East and their widening conflicts. And God, we pray also for all those whom we name before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. God, we thank you that you not only hear our prayers, but that you listen to them, and that you've proved yourself time and time again to be faithful. Hear us now, God, and help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition now to a time of reflection and generosity, I'd like to remind you that you can always give to support the ministry of Wrightsville United Methodist Church, including this service of the Vine, through our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, and also through the mail. Let's continue now to worship God. Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today at church, we are celebrating a really special Sunday. It's called World Communion Sunday. On World Communion Sunday, we remember that there are Christians all over the world who are celebrating the same thing today, communion, which you'll remember is our special meal that helps us to remember Jesus. I brought with me today a big globe that shows all of the whole countries in our whole world to help us think about where all of these different Christians are. So first, we live, do you know where we live? We live in North Carolina. And so North Carolina, Wilmington is right here on our map. But we're not the only people who are celebrating communion today. There's also people who live in El Salvador, which is in Central America. And we have teams from our church here at Wrightsville who go and spend time with some of the Christians that are there in El Salvador, and they get to know each other. Actually, some of our youth just went and had a really great time this summer getting to know new friends in El Salvador. Um, there's also people who are in Rotafunk in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And they are worshiping today too. And some of them are people who have helped us to also build a hospital in Sierra Leone so that people who are sick can get the help that they need. And there's also people who are worshiping this morning all the way in South Korea. And that's where our pastor, Pastor Nsu, came from and where her family is probably worshiping today. It's so cool because you can see how many miles separate all of us. But when we're celebrating communion, 
we're somehow connected with all of them. All over the world, everyone who believes in Jesus is celebrating communion together. I'm so grateful to be a part of something that's that big. Would you say a prayer with me? Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for World Communion Sunday. I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you've taken time to worship with us on the vine. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 3. It's part of our Be Like Jesus series. And here we're going to see Jesus meet a man named Nicodemus. Let's read along. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts today, Lord, that they would be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I got to tell you, I don't see very well without my glasses on. Fairly common problem for people. God bless you if you don't need corrective lenses or if you've never had LASIK or cataract surgery. I've been wearing glasses now for about 35 years but I've actually needed corrective lenses for even longer than that. See, I found out at age 12 I was going to need glasses, except I didn't want to wear glasses at age 12. I didn't like the way they looked. I didn't like the way they felt. I was very active in sports, and it seemed like they might be cumbersome. They might fall off. They might get smashed. I was just dead set on not wearing glasses. So instead of getting glasses, I opted for contact lenses. And I wore those contacts throughout middle and high school. Have you ever worn contacts? you know anyone who has? Do you remember the first time you tried to put those things on your eyes? I think it took me an hour and a half. It's so weird putting something on my eyes for the first time. Your eyelids and eyelashes are pre-programmed to protect you from getting things in your eye. So it is very hard to intentionally put something on your eyeball. Oh, was it worth it. I will never forget the ride home from the optometrist. The world became brilliant. I remember seeing individual leaves and branches on trees for the very first time while riding in a car. I could see the definitions in the clouds. I could read signs on buildings. I was fascinated by the fact that I could even read the letters and numbers on license plates. I think my mom thought I was being silly that I'd gotten so excited over such simple things. But suddenly, there was all this beauty that I'd just never noticed before. I kind of felt like a fool. There was so much I'd been missing. 
I instantly got better in school because I could see the board more clearly. I got better in sports because I could see the baseball better. I could see the rim and basketball better. I was even friendlier because I noticed people from farther away than I had before. Within a few weeks, I'd become more confident, all because I could see mo so much better than I had before. What do you call it when everything you thought you knew turns out to be wrong or at least incomplete? An epiphany? A revelation? Whatever you call it, that's what happened to Nicodemus on the day he met Jesus. He got new theological lenses with which to see the world. We're told only one specific thing about Nicodemus, that he's a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. Everything else we have to kind of infer from the text. Now being a Pharisee, it's pretty safe to assume that he thought he had it all figured out. He had his systematic theology and all of his I's were dotted and his T's were crossed. He could debate unbelievers and win. He could argue the Sadducees into a corner that they could never back out of. He knew scripture forwards and backwards and could quote chapter and verse. He knew all the laws of the Torah and he understood the subtle nuances that were hidden within them. He had his bachelor's degree and his seminary degree framed and hanging on the wall of his office. He wore a clerical collar even on his days off. He liked it when people deferred to him and asked him to say the opening prayer at meetings, meals, and social events. One did not become a Pharisee with a half-hearted commitment. To reach that level of Judaism, one had to make a very serious investment, do lots of work, and be totally sold out for God. You had to take your religious life very seriously, and Nicodemus did just that. When it came to religion, he had it all together, and he knew that he had it all together, and he liked that everybody else knew that he had it all together. And then, one night, he does something completely out of character. He goes under cover of darkness to see Jesus. Why? Why does he go? And why does he go at night? Did he have some questions that he wanted to ask Jesus? Had he heard something about Jesus and the message he was teaching and wanted to see it for himself? Did he see in Jesus a kindred spirit, someone who seemed to think like he thought? His opening lines to Jesus would tend to give credence to this notion. He seems to think that Jesus has it all together too. He may think that Jesus is Pharisee material himself and has come to offer him a sponsorship into this unique club. Rabbi, he says, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. A little flattery, perhaps. Or maybe he's sincere. Maybe he's just here to tell Jesus that he's a big fan, that he's impressed with all the work Jesus is doing. Maybe he'd heard about that wedding where Jesus turned rainwater into Opus One. Maybe he just wants to give Jesus a pat on the back, an old attaboy for all that he's doing on behalf of the kingdom of God. I don't know. But Nicodemus has heard something that makes him question his own understanding, his own theology, his own outlook on life. And he wants to hear more. And these open, opening lines are meant to communicate that he intends to take whatever Jesus says very seriously. Whether he's come to compliment Jesus or to simply ask a question, he comes by night under the cover of darkness. Why? Well, because his colleagues don't like Jesus, and his visit would not be well taken by other Pharisees. To even hint that he might be taking Jesus seriously could bring some serious consequences down on his head. He could be excommunicated, forced to turn in his Pharisee card, simply for wanting to ask a question. Have you ever had that experience where you're afraid to ask a question about religion because you thought you might be judged? It's pretty common in religious circles, especially in churches that believe you've got to believe every single thing that the preacher believes or you're going to hell. I don't ever want to be that kind of church. I really want us to be a church where it's safe to ask questions. I don't know that I portray that type of personality myself, 
but I want to be the type of church where it's okay to think out loud. Nevertheless, if Nicodemus has come to Jesus with a question, he's about to be disappointed with Jesus' answer. And if he's come thinking that he and Jesus are about to be best buds and friends of one mind, he's going to be a little frustrated. Because Jesus' next line comes almost like an interruption. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Now, translations vary on this text. Some say born again, others born anew. Ours says born from above. Whatever the phrase, Nicodemus' translation gets it totally wrong. He's a true biblical literalist, and he wants to know how a person can be physically born a second time. Jesus explains that he's speaking metaphorically about a spiritual experience that's like being born a second time. But Nicodemus still doesn't get it. How can these things be, he asks. Jesus points out that there are other dimensions of reality beside the literal physical dimension. In particular, there is a spiritual heavenly dimension that Nicodemus needs to be aware of. In fact, he says, it's time to throw away those old literalistic glasses and put on a new pair that can make you aware of the invisible, but no less very real world of the spirit. This is no easy task. This is going to take some hard and sometimes painful work. Just as physical birth is a difficult and painful experience, so can spiritual birth. But it is so worth it. You hear what Jesus is saying? Do you hear the implications? Experiencing the kingdom of God as Jesus is opening it up to us is not a pleasant walk through the gates of Oz. It's rather like a birth experience. A spiritual experience that's going to be full of tears and pain, of shouts of triumph, of expressions of joy and love and laughter and tears, just like any physical birth has ever been. And it's to this kind of experience, this spiritual birth experience, that Jesus is inviting all of us. Leave your religious baggage behind. Kick your theological assumptions to the curb. Abandon all those ancient and archaic doctrines and dogmas, the oppressive rules and crushing laws, the shoulda, woulda, oughta, couldas, the judgment, the superiority. Step away from all you've been told. Take the hand of Jesus and start all over with the beginning with him. That's the new birth experience Jesus is talking about. Starting over from the beginning with Jesus as your guide. Not some pretend Jesus. Not the one that we make up in our mind and chat with over coffee. Not some nice ethereal Jesus whose only admonition is to be nice because he's nice. And not some Jesus of myth and legend that's waiting to return to earth as a sword-wielding judge and executioner either. No. The Jesus we're invited to walk with is the Jesus of the Gospels. The Jesus who lives and breathes in the red letters of the New Testament. The Jesus who loves and heals and teaches and feeds and frustrates and corrects and suffers and dies for those that he loves in order to show them what real love looks like. Come and walk with that Jesus and you will never see the world the same way again. Of course, all of this hinges on our ability to admit that what we thought was so was in fact not so. It relies on our ability to admit that we were wrong. And that's tough. Scientific psychology tells us that even in the face of overwhelming evidence that we are wrong, we will go through unimaginable ordeals, jump through just about any hoop, undertake unbelievable difficulties to convince ourselves that we were actually right all along. In fact, it has been proven that when people are faced with undeniable proof that they are wrong, their tendency will be to cling to their disproved ideas or perceptions even tighter than they did before. This is what we call dissonance theory. 
And while it's referred to as a theory, it's held to as fact in the scientific community. If you'll allow me an oversimplification, it works like this. When people discover that they are holding two mutually exclusive ideas or perceptions at the same time, they will tend to find a way to hold on to the one that they've held the longest or the one that they've put the most personal investment into and they will discard or devalue the other. If, for instance, I've been smoking for, say, the past 30 years, and one day you tell me smoking's unhealthy, I will probably try to find a reason to dismiss what you are telling me rather than to quit smoking. Or if I accept and believe that your prediction that the world is going to end on October 15th, and I go and sell my house, and I quit my job, and I move in with you and your followers to await the end of the world, and then it doesn't come on October 15th, well, on October 16th, I'll probably find a reason that I can still believe in you and actually start trying to recruit others into our little cult. All of this goes to say, simply, that it is very hard for us to admit that we are wrong. It's darn near impossible, in fact. Yet Jesus is asking us to open ourselves up to that possibility. Not about little inconsequential things like, what do you like better, Coke or Pepsi, or who's your favorite football team? He's asking us to accept the possibility that we might be wrong about the very nature of the universe and our place in it. He's inviting us to take everything we have thought about these things and leave them behind and to go without all that baggage on a journey with him. His promise, if we do that, is that our lives can become more real, more authentic, more full, more whole, more holy. That our lives will take on a quality that's eternal in nature if we will just come with him. Well, did it work? Did Nicodemus do as Jesus suggested? Did he leave behind all of his accumulated stuff, his religious ideas, his rules, his judgments, his stiff, unyielding doctrine, his old spiritual baggage? Did he just leave it all behind and follow Jesus? Or was it too hard to admit that he was wrong? Here's what the Gospel of John goes on to tell us. He mentions Nicodemus two more times in his Gospel. The next time we see Nicodemus is in the seventh chapter, when Nicodemus actually gets into an argument with other Pharisees about Jesus and invites them to go hear him for themselves. And then the last time we hear from him is in chapter 19 after Jesus' death on the cross. This time, Joseph of Arimathea comes to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body so that he can bury it in accordance with, Jesus, with uh, Jewish customs. Nicodemus, we are told, goes with Joseph of Arimathea and brings the spices and herbs that will be used to anoint the body for burial. So clearly, Nicodemus has been changed. No longer does he come under the cover of darkness. No longer does he come with words of flattery. Now, when all of the other public followers of Jesus have abandoned him and run away, Nicodemus comes forward in the light of day, when it is extremely dangerous to be a follower of Jesus, and he makes his devotion and commitment publicly known before the entire world. This is the invitation. This is the challenge. This is the promise that John brings to us in this story. He says, behold, the light of the world who casts out darkness, who answers our questions and embraces our doubts and offers us growth and health and fruitful living. Behold, the bread of life who feeds our spiritual hunger so that we will never be hungry again. He says, behold, the gate through which every soul can walk who seeks to know the living God. And behold, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Behold the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Seek him, as did Nicodemus. Let Jesus into your life. Come to know him intimately as he comes to know you. And he will change your life if you will only let him. 
the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we, we love you. We know you want the best for us. You created us. And Lord, sometimes we get in our own way. We think we've got it all figured out, but Jesus comes to us and tells us we've probably got it wrong. And even, even if we don't, then that's okay. We just got to follow him. Lord, teach us not to get so caught up in all the other stuff. To follow our Lord and Savior wherever he leads. We ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Our service will continue with Holy Communion. And so we invite you to get a piece of bread and some liquid so that you might consume the elements uh, with us. And so if you don't have those, why don't you hit pause on the video, go ahead and get those things together and come back and join us. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, praying together. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we, we confess, confess that, that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to continue to pray in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the, In the name, name of Jesus Christ, Christ you, you are forgiven. forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give, give our, our thanks and, and praise. praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. 
Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for us. This is the blood of Christ, shed for us. You're invited now to consume the elements that you have in your home. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Are you open to something different? Are you open to something new? Are you open to something that's eternal? If so, I pray that you're open to Jesus, to his love, and to his call on your life, and that you'd be willing to ask some questions, to be in conversation with him, maybe even develop a relationship with him so that you would follow wherever he goes. We may think we have the answers, but Jesus does have the answer. He is the answer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.